school's Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. You're going to hear evidence about the impact of these murders on the family, friends, and or the community of the decedents. Joaquin Oliver. <sighs> A name etched into the depths of my soul. To say I was shattered would be an understatement. And the initial pain of finding out she was dead has been nothing compared to the pain of living without her. I hate everyone and everything. With the power of my AR, you will all know who I am. Agonizing testimony from family of the 17 people killed in the Parkland School Massacre continued today. The week started with the families of Joaquin Oliver, Elena Petty, and Scott Beagle taking the stand. Are you the mother of Joaquin Oliver? Yes, I am. But today, I must let the world hear from me. To accept that he's not physically here with us, it still is an issue for me. Why? because it hurts me very deeply. I must let the listeners feel how painful it is to live with this deep hole in my heart. I can deal with my family gatherings. It is impossible to deal with everybody that was used to get together with, and he is not there. That's done. I can't share happy moments or see pictures with all his cousins, and he's not there. I'm going to do it. Okay. Joaquin Oliver. Oh, God. A name etched into the depths of my soul. I lost the love letters he was writing for me in that fourth period creative writing class. I never actually received them. They were pinned to his shirt. I miss my best friend and the way he made me feel a fool. On February 14th, 2018, my heart stopped beating. Our fourth and youngest child, Elena Petty, was taken back home to live with our Heavenly Father. Elena was 14 years old when she died. She went to school that day in her uniform for JROTC, which was a school program she loved. She was in her final class of the day when she died. I'd like to talk a little bit about who she was. I am five years her senior, but in many ways, she was more grown up than I, sorry, I feel I ever will be. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my son, Scott J. Beagle. It's been 1,630 days since I last spoke to my son. On February 14, 2018, my life was shattered forever. I have a box over my heart with a lid so tightly closed, trying to keep all my emotions under control. But today, I'm taking the lid off that box. I spoke with Scott almost every day. The conversations could be just 30 second touch, hi mom, can't talk, but just making sure you're okay. Or a five minute conversation, mom, I gotta tell you about our cross country meet today, or I have a great idea for a lesson plan I wanna run by you. Scott looked me straight in the eye and said, all I ask is that you make my mother happy. That was the easy part. After Linda and I got married, I decided that I wanted to adopt Scott and Melissa. Scott and Linda are New York Yankee fans. I am a New York Mets fan. Even though Scott was a lifelong Yankee fan, he made a point of making sure we went to at least one Mets game a season. The last game we went to was in 2017. I really miss those games. I really miss a catch with my son. Today, the first of the victim impact statements were delivered bravely by the family of victim Alyssa Al-Hadif. Both her mother and father took the stand. Here are some of what they had to say to this jury. This kind of pain and emptiness will most certainly last forever. It is the most devastating event 
when a parent outlives his or her own child. There isn't even a word for it in the English language. <clears throat> as though it's a natural, abnormal nature, indescribable, and unable to be named. Alyssa Miriam Alhadef was my first child and my only daughter, my best friend and love of my life. She was the heartbeat of our family. She loved soccer, and riding the waves of Long Beach Island, New Jersey, every summer. Alyssa always kept us on our toes, always. She was an incredible big sister to Robbie and Kobe, and negotiator extraordinaire during family's discussions. As the captain of her soccer team, she was a source of support, protection, and motivation for her friends both on and off the field. Alyssa had no idea how amazing she was. In fact, her humility was one of her most attractive qualities. I think about her every day, and I wish she was there, wish she was here with us. I look around our home and see photo albums that will never be filled. It was four years ago to everyone, but to me it was yesterday. Alyssa will always be 14, and I will always be at the point in life with her. All I know is a piece of my heart was not just cut out, but it was ripped out of my damn chest. For four years, I've watched so many struggle. Well, the only option I've had is to keep it together for my family. And insert, inside I burned like a damn inferno. It took me so long to be able to feel empathy again. And this prevented me from doing what I'm good at, which is caring for patients. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to live my life with anger now and make it fuel my existence. Like my wife, I try and stay busy so I don't break down. While the world gets to move on with their lives, we don't have that luxury. Missing our daughter every single day. No parent is supposed to have this grief. Without our daughter, Alyssa, our lives have been changed forever. Joining me is my guest for this hour, former federal prosecutor, Nima Romani. Nima, always appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise. No doubt, heart-wrenching testimony how do you think the jury is handling listening to all of these victim impact statements? I mean, Ashley, it was so incredibly sad watching on court TV. I can't imagine what it would be like to hear that testimony live in person as a juror. And it has to affect their deliberations. I mean, we're looking at those aggravating factors. You know, Nicholas Cruz acting in a cold, calculated, premeditated manner, causing great risk of harm to many victims, um, no legal or moral justification, and really what is the most important, just the heinous and cruel nature of his crime. I mean, the deadliest school shooting in American history. So, you know, we see folks in the courtroom wiping away tears. I'm wiping away tears in my office here in Los Angeles, and I'm in a studio. So I imagine that those jurors are feeling the same way you and I are. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, Nima. And it raises a good point that you mentioned, and that is the fact that everybody's crying. We can see in the courtroom, not only are the families in the gallery crying, defense attorneys are crying. Court staff is crying. So does this at any point become something that if this jury decides death penalty for Nicholas Cruz, that this is appealable, that the that it was prejudicial and should not have been allowed to the extent that it's being allowed. You know, so on one hand, the victims do have a right to be heard. And obviously this is a unique case because there are so many victims, 17 murder counts, 17 attempted murder counts. So they have a right to talk about the loss of their loved ones, their children, their spouses. But, and Ashley, you raised it. When you're doing death penalty defense, capital defense, 
you're really thinking about the next step. There are those mandatory state appeals, there's mandatory federal appeals, habeas petitions. So oftentimes, these defense lawyers, they're looking at, you know, an appellate panel or district judge as more likely to overturn a death sentence than those 12 jurors. There's going to be a lot of pressure on them to return a death sentence in this case. Obviously, the defense is hoping they can get one or two. It has to be unanimous. We all know that. But, you know, a lot of what the defense is doing here in terms of their filing, in terms of their objections, is looking at that next level. And Nima, if talk about a case in which you look at it from the outside and say the death penalty is appropriate in terms of aggravating factors, this is it. I mean, a school massacre with 17 people killed, 17 injury, it meets a lot of those aggravating factor elements after we've watched the evidence. How hard do you think it is for a defense attorney to then create a story consisting of mitigating factors that could convince at least one juror even though this is the kind of case the death penalty might have been designed to apply to, there's enough mitigating factors to say, spare his life. It's very hard. If you believe in the death penalty, this is a death penalty case. And I understand the public policy reasons why some folks are opposed to the death penalty, but this is gonna be a very challenging case for the defense. And they really have to start from the beginning. They're gonna talk about uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and how it affected Nicholas Cruz, how the system failed him. Clearly, he has significant mental health issues. And they're just going to go and discuss all that and basically tell those jurors that Nicholas Cruz never had a chance and you need to spare his life. So they've reserved their opening statement and I think they're going to come out strong when they start next week. Yeah, I agree with you. And reserving that opening statement, I think, is brilliant because they knew what to expect. They knew the jury was going to be listening to heart-wrenching testimony. And then they're going to start with these mitigating factors. And Nima, the reality is none of us have heard any of the testimony or evidence about these mitigating factors. And truth of the matter is, it could be by the time they present everything, the defense, I mean, maybe we're all going to feel like this poor man, boy at the time, really 19, didn't stand a chance. Yeah, we don't know. There's been a lot of speculation. You know, you know, we've talked about the fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, drug and alcohol abuse, bullying, um, him having special needs. You know, him being rejected by female. I mean, again, this is all speculation. You know, both here on court TV and on social media. But we really won't know what direction the defense is going to go in until they present their case next week. Their experts are gonna come and I expect their experts to be very strong. This is one of the most high profile, probably the longest penalty phase I've ever seen in my 20 year career. So um, I expect them to come out, come out swinging and come out very aggressively when they present their case. Yeah, you're right, especially for penalty phase. We know he already pled guilty, so this is a very lengthy hearing.